Do you currently find yourself in the permaculture pit? Full of knowledge and enthusiasm for your permaculture journey, but not sure what steps to take next? I can help you find your way up, out, and onward from this place with a single meandering session. In an hour-long phone call, together we'll explore your specific situation and collaborate on actions you can take as soon as we end the conversation. Find out more at thepermaculturepodcast.com slash meandering. If you're well on your journey, but would like to discuss a project or plan in depth with additional resources and follow-ups, I also offer consultations so we can work side by side to bring your vision into the world. Complete details at thepermaculturepodcast.com slash consultation. For this year's annual call to action, I'm raising funds to create documentary films with permaculture practitioners, farmers, activists, and others. Producing in-person videos are a more intensive undertaking that can't happen in an office or behind a desk, but rather involve being on the road and in the field for days at a time before coming back to the studio to put it all together. Making that happen needs your help. As a thank you to anyone who donates now through the anniversary of the show in October, you'll receive early access to all the documentaries produced by the show in the year ahead and a thank you in the credits. You can donate online at paypal.me slash permaculturepodcast or by dropping something in the mail. Scott Mann, 210 East Fairfax Street, number 300, Falls Church, Virginia, 22046. This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. In this episode, co-host David Bilbrey sits down again with Martin Ping, the executive director of Hawthorne Valley Association, a nonprofit whose mission is social and cultural renewal through the integration of education, agriculture, and the arts. In the recently released conversation with Martin, which he and David recorded at the Prairie Festival, they took a deeper look at the work of Hawthorne Valley and Martin's role in the organization, So if you'd like to learn more about him and the numerous programs there, you'll find that in your podcast feed or from the link in the show notes. Today's discussion is one of social permaculture, how to engage hearts, minds, and consciousness during this time of climate crisis and transition. Martin uses his time at Hawthorne Valley and his thoughts as an educator and elder within the region to look at how we can build community, cultural, and personal resilience. We jump into the interview with David recounting an email exchange with Martin from a few years ago and a quote from David Orr. Enjoy this time with them, and I'll join you again after. A couple of years ago, I was looking through an email, and we were trading quotes, and there's this quote that you had uh, sent me from David Orr that I think uh, kind of frames the conversation that I want to have today, so I'll I'll start with this here. Uh, So David says, uh, we need a generation that rises above despair or fantastical thinking and sees the world as a network of systems, patterns, and possibilities, and so can give hope of an authentic foundation. So I think that quote is more relevant now than uh, ever before. And since our first interview, you know, much has changed in the world. The need for regenerative solutions has not changed, but the awareness of the need, I think, has increased. And in that sense, I think there's, there's an opportunity that maybe wasn't there before. And you know, life continues to be tumultuous. As we've seen over recent history, the worldwide response to climate change varies depending on the world worldview of the political leaders who are in control of our national governments. And with that in mind, what would you recommend as a way to move forward for people who care about future generations in the environment? Start by listening to David Orr. He's just such a both brilliant man and a good-hearted man, and as funny as as they come, he's just such a great person. He also said, and I think this is equally important, uh, hope is a verb with its shirt sleeves rolled up. And one thing we have to do is maintain a sense of hope. And that's not a sense of false optimism that things will just work out, but a sense of hope that allows us to stay in the game and gives us the courage to to put one foot in front of the other and, and to keep trying because it's as you mentioned, the challenges are immense, and uh, they can be almost paralyzing in, the, in scope. And when you lose a year or two years or four years of you know, dawdling away when we really need to have a concerted effort uh, for this ex- existential threat of climate chaos, 
It is really, really frustrating. And the clock is running and we already know we're, we're living on a changed planet and s- certain things, no matter how strong our efforts will not be reversed. That we're just, things are set in motion now that will continue to change and alter the planet. And we need, if anything, to adapt our own resiliency and our own consciousness to move forward with those changes. And that does not mean that we have a pass to not do the hard work at reducing and stopping the the burning of fossil fuels and the loading of more CO2 in the atmosphere. All those things have to happen. But even if we stop tomorrow, unfortunately, the, as I understand the science, the effects of all the previous years of, of burning are still cumulatively mounting and the uh, feedback loops from that are just, I think, going to astonish us with their severity. And that's part of the challenge is we know that we're in for some, well, I think Fred Kirschman called moments of grace. He might've been quoting somebody else. So we, we know there's going to be challenges. So learning to be resilient human beings, both with what you need to live, supplies and all energy and all of that, but also just emotionally and and spiritually having that resilience, I think is really important. And uh, the last couple of years, if it's taught us nothing else, it's taught us the importance of, of worldview and perspective. And well, dare I say, you know, truth, how you evaluate something and determine that it is true or not. So, you know, with Waldorf, you're kind of starting at the very beginning with children and, and framing that worldview in a way that's regenerative and really helps speak to who they are and, and kind of calls forth that true self, if you will, for people who are already grown up and out of that <laughs> opportunity, um, what are some ways that people can begin to move uh, towards a, a more regenerative and sort of holistic future? I think partly for me, I'm, I'm trying to stay in the mindset and practice the, the idea of, of paying attention and care and you know, make sure I'm caring about what's going on in, in my community and, and caring about my neighbors. And it's, it starts with my family because I have some extended family right around me, which is a real blessing. I have a daughter and grandchildren next door. And I think we have to extend that further. What we think of as a fundamental social law, that if we can do our work in service to our community, then our needs will be met. And one could think about that for a while, and there's a logic to it. If Because if we were all doing that, then we're all making sure that our needs are, are being met and, and people are also consequently looking out for me. And I do sense that and feel that living here. And I've been here since uh, 84. So, you know, we built up some real relationships there. And I, I'm frustrated by the divisiveness and by the polarization of every issue and by the inability of people to come together around what we share in common, because I find that divide and conquer is kind of the oldest trick in the playbook, and it's it's a cheap one to fall for. And I I wish we wouldn't. I wish we would re- recognize that we're all in this together. We all need each other, regardless of our, our political stripes or our pick any number of things that we think might divide us. And I think if we peel it all back, we, we have way more in common than we have to squabble about. And If we would work on building uh, those relationships and the mutual respect for each other, then when we come to the things that we disagree about, we could keep them objectively between us as, oh, yeah, that's this thing that we're that we're still trying to come to understand together. But we know each other and we respect each other and we can look each other in the face and and tell truths to each other. We just need a lot more of that. And you mentioned early childhood. That's where it begins. And so. When we do pay attention, we should pay attention to our children. They're coming already with a sense of truth, beauty, and goodness that we don't want to disrupt. And certainly we don't want to jade or create cynicism too early. We want them to be able to really live in that space and uh, have it as a seed capacity for later in their life. I would say of all the things we do here at Hawthorne Valley, the early childhood, our early childhood program is is really one of the gifts to our times because it's a place where childhood is really revered and understood and, and respected and honored for what it is. And I think it's so foundational to who we will become later in life. And 
you know, we don't dare want to mess that one up. I'm coming out of the trades as a, a builder in my previous incarnation. And, and I always say, you know, if you, if you mess up on the foundation of a house, you just pay for it all through the rest of the project and you haven't set yourself out for an easy task. Well, that's just a house. That's not a human being. I think we should take great care in creating a solid foundation for our children to become good citizens and well-functioning adults. And that's up to all of us to really provide that container for our young people. So can you talk a little bit about what this last year has been like for you guys at Hawthorne Valley and how you've adapted? Yeah, so it's been a mixed bag. The, as I say, the residential programs were the first things to just go. And, and that was painful because it's the heart and soul of Hawthorne Valley. It's how we began this idea of having a farm that would welcome children from urban centers to have their week-long immersion on the farm, nine-year-olds as the primary target audience. And we've been doing that for 50 years or 49 years, week in and week out since the fall of 72. And for that to end, it's just brutal. We miss it. And the, the farm got very quiet because not only did our visiting schools program not come, but we also uh, shot Hawthorne Valley Waldorf School and went remote at the uh, end of the 19. 19- a 20 school year, you know, in March, in the spring of that year. And very strange to be on the farm and not have the pitter patter of children's feet fertilizing the soil along with the, with the cow manure and everything else that we're doing. That was painful. Fortunately, we were able to move some of our colleagues, most of our colleagues from the visiting schools program and place-based learning programs into positions in the water school or in our retail store. So we were, a, we were able to minimize the, the kind of carnage of having to lay people off. That's one, one strong plug for diversity, that we have this, this diverse ecosystem of activities and having that variety allowed us to have some resilience. It's, if, we're, if we wanna look you know, to nature as a pattern, you mentioned the patterns that David Orr quoted about well, the pattern is one of, of, of complexity, diversity, and that affords a certain resilience. And we saw that out of, out of 200 and something employees, I think, you know, we, we laid off less than uh, 10% of that, of our staff. And we did it carefully and it was, you know, and, and now we're back up to really up to full strength again. The store, on the other hand, the retail store had... It was like the other end of the spectrum. The first weekend of COVID, when people were doing their kind of panic buying, and you were, you saw this mm-hmm. stores around the country with empty shelves and nobody could find toilet paper. We had numbers in our store those two days of that weekend that we never even would have imagined possible as far as uh, single day sales. And then that continued not at that quite that you know spike, but more than by a long margin, more than what our single day record sales had ever previously been on a major fair day or a couple of days before Thanksgiving or something. And that that was a, a kind of an odd blessing. The store had to adjust to do curbside. We did, we put in a delivery program. We tried to make it possible for people to feel, uh, to keep our staff safe and for shoppers to feel safe coming here. And I would say it continues this day to be the numbers are not nearly as inflated as they were, but there's a lot of people exited the New York City area. And there was an article in the New York Times just a week ago that Hudson, New York, which is our largest town in the county here, about 12 or 13 miles from the farm, is out of 292 metro areas in the United States, it's like the number one in change in, in population because of COVID migration. The county is so jam-packed and it's incredibly hard to find a rental or a house for sale. And we know this because we have people coming to teach at the school or people coming to send their families to school and they're having a really hard time uh, finding housing. So, So it's this weird mixed bag. The water school closed and then we worked the teachers and 
you know, others supporting them, but the teachers worked all through the summer before the 2020-21 school year to prepare the campus to safely welcome the students back. Well, how'd they do that? They rented tents for every single class so that they could have classes outside. We actually built a couple of greenhouses and partitioned them off to house four of the classes. And when we go back to a normal world uh, or whatever that will look like, those greenhouses will revert to farm use, but we were able to put them up and, and use them for school. And they worked brilliantly. There were music classes out there and, and school opened on September 1, in-person learning. And we made it, we've made it all through the school year with uh, everyone staying healthy and being able to stay open in-person learning. And we're super, super grateful for that. And I have to really take my hat off to my colleagues in the school. It has been a Herculean task to accomplish this with all you can imagine levels of measures to keep people safe, people who feel quite differently about, or say all over the spectrum as far as their comfort level, but but everybody soldiering on. Some teachers are teaching remote, but it's all, the students are here. There are some students who are also choosing to be remote and mostly because of, you know, specific situations with people with, um, um, you know, a loved one at home that might be in a, in a, a group that might be more susceptible. All this to say, the school is open. The weather is getting better. So being outdoors is not as uh, <laughs> as <laughs> interesting as it was in the middle of January. But my grade 12 economics class in November, and I have to say it was cold underneath that tent. But we were sat in parkas. Kids were wrapped up in down sleeping bags. <laughs> And we we did it. It was great. And there's something about it that speaks to the resilience. That resilience piece is great. I hadn't thought about that thinking about Hawthorne Valley before, but yeah, you can see that illustration in this COVID scenario. We definitely need to build more resilience into many different aspects of our society, as we've seen, you know, recently with like these huge power outages in Texas and just different things where these systems that we depend on and sort of take for granted that they're functioning are far more fragile than I think a lot of us realize on a day-to-day basis, building that resilience into our communities, into our systems, into, you know, our cultures, I think is really important, which for that to happen, that there has to be a lot more people that are having that you know, learning to move from egocentric to world-centric and even cosmocentric, right? So expanding that worldview. Could you speak to that a little bit? You're forming young minds at the Waldorf School, but for the, the rest of the adult world, how does someone go about changing the way they see? I run the risk of kind of trespassing on other people's private freedom to, you know, relate to the world in their own way. And, and I, I want to be careful that I'm, I, I could say what has worked for me and what I, what I see is, well, I would like to invite people to consider, let's put it that way, invitation only. I'm not, I'm not really giving something prescriptive here. I just think it's mm-hmm. something, to, something to consider. So let's take what you said at the beginning of the question, which is looking at uh, energy systems. And I would say something even more basic and essential, which is our food system. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw this the real cracks in the industrial agribusiness model of our food system when you had these massive enterprises, which couldn't get their product to people who desperately needed it. Stores mm-hmm. that had empty shelves, but the, you know, the, the, the system just all of a sudden was collapsing under its own inflexibility because of its specialized nature of being efficient. You know, this with I'm putting efficient in air quotation marks. And, and it's, I'm not saying it's all bad, but I'm saying there were things there where when you read about and you know people are going hungry and you see you know people desperate to get food and then you know that farmers are having to dump their milk or slaughter their animals because the processors are sh- shut down or the distribution networks are not working and you're just like wow that system is more than fragile and that's the system we've created and as you say when it works it seems to work but one could also question the longer term effects of downstream pollution, the, the dishonesty of off 
balance sheet accounting, the, the highly subsidized aspects of the system. And you could just say, if, if we were really designing something for resilience, I don't think that's what we would come up with. So I would love to you know, challenge us to say, well, what could it look like? And how could we do it in such a way that we're, we're not leaving anybody behind and making the transition to something, to a system that is you know, maybe more, more localized, more diverse, more uh, maybe you know, diversifying also the ownership of the system, that it's not just a, a few really big players that are basically owning and controlling everything, but you put the ownership back into into the communities and, and the decision-making back into the communities that are going to be affected by those decisions. So I think there's a, there's a lot there and it feels complicated and complex and it makes you want to put your head in your hands and, and say, Oh my God, how do you, where do we even start? But it is starting. And one could say, you know, in my lifetime, I could see huge shifts in the thinking around this and, even though it still represents a small percentage of the overall food system at large, I think that the, the satisfaction of, of being able to eat well, being in relationship with the people who are producing your food, knowing how it's you know, stewarding the earth in your own community is something that has uh, a nourishment to it that exceeds the, uh, the calories and the uh, nutritional value of the food alone. So we have to be able to get that back, get to a place where that is shared, where everybody's invited to the table, where it's not perceived as elitist and where, you know, people are told that they can only um, really afford uh, certain calories, which maybe are not as nutritious for them and maybe lead to other longer term health consequences, because that's the big system that, you know, gets the majority of the support and subsidization, it's not a level playing field and it's a tough one to kind of go up against. We see in the Hudson Valley some promise in the collaborative uh, networking of, of farmers. And it's interesting, you know, when you're in the business of, of training farmers that people wonder, well, gosh, aren't you training your competition? And I say, not at all. We're, we're building a resilient food system over time, and it's going to take time. We've been at it for only 50 years. And the, the competition is this kind of larger agribusiness model that is, that is we feel, is, is creating maybe more harm than good in the end. And so we want, we want to create something that can feed the planet uh, and hopefully with, with um, less uh, negative unintended consequences. And it's interesting to see, like just small stories here. We had uh, we had a, a local farmer organize all the farmers into buying some essential equipment for you know starting your plants and carrying your product from field to washroom. And I forget how many farms were participating. I think it was forty something, and it saved the farmer seventeen thousand dollars to do this big bulk purchase. And it all came here to Hawthorne Valley on two tractor trailers. And we broke down the orders and put them into orders by farm. And then the farms came and picked them up. And that so $17,000 doesn't sound like a ton, but when you're a subsistence farmer, it's, it makes a difference. And then we had a, another friend who, who did the same thing with buying bulk laying hens. And farms as far down south as the Stone Barns in Westchester County came up and these folks, just neighbors and good friends, they just took it upon themselves to organize it. They didn't get anything out of doing it. And just the satisfaction of supporting that community. And today we were talking about, we have a small grain mill in our bakery and we, we mill to uh, specifically to batch. And it's, it's nice to have the fresh wheat berries and, and mill them, but it's, it also pre, uh, has its downsides. And there are a lot of other farms that are starting to grow grain again, a, a lot for spirits and beer, but, but more for bread as well. So we're, we're talking with all these other farms about actually having a centralized mill and we will all participate to make that possible. And somebody can make a, a business out of that. And we would all benefit from it. And I think that, you know, the eaters and the beverage uh, drinkers will benefit as well. 
So it's an interesting thing what, what Fred Kirschman calls ag in the middle, where it's not going to be the, the small independent little CSAs that are solely going to feed the world. And we know the, the large agribusiness uh, model has got its cracks. So it's what's the ag in the middle? And that seems to me to, to be rebuilding the infrastructure where the smaller farms and mid-sized farms and independent farms, locally owned farms, can work more collaboratively and be more mutually supportive to, in a way, mimic the large without trying to become the less bad version of like that which we know uh, needs to be transformed. It's fun to watch, and I'm sure it's going on in other parts of the country. I'm, I'm kind of, in the last year, I've been really confined to Hudson Valley, and, and uh, that's not a bad thing. I love where I am, but I haven't been out, out and about to see uh, what's going on in, in some of these other places. I know, for instance, somebody up in um, Whatcom County, is that the name of the county, up, in, uh, up where Bellingham is in Washington? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's Whatcom County. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they're doing some interesting stuff with grain up there, and then one of the guys that was involved in that was uh, in the Hudson Valley just last week or two weeks ago, and and uh, he was going to try swing by Hawthorne Valley and it didn't work out, so he said next time he's in Hudson Valley he'll come check us out, and I'll certainly go up and check his operation out. I have friends down in in Gainesville area doing stuff in Florida, and it's it's fun to just be aware of these these uh, little islands of um, culture and and uh, trying to redesign the economy. So what would you consider some of the building blocks of, of uh, healthy perception? Like, you know, there's kind of a framework you're teaching, obviously, at, at Waldorf. Um, what are kind of those, some of those key pieces that can help people to just begin a foundation of seeing the world in a hopefully more holistic way? And then also how that translates into how you teach kids to think about and, and talk about things as polarizing as politics, especially having just gone through an election year last year. You said it right there, the, um, you know, the holistic nature of it all. To me, it's the, what we're, what I feel we're really on the cusp of is, is shifting our consciousness to a more integral understanding of how the world works. And, and that is that it is integrated, it's interconnected, it's interdependent. We are nature, we're not separate. So we've had this very interesting for several hundred years of taking ourselves out of the story and really separating out and and I and thou and, you know, everything is other. And it's produced some very interesting results. And I'm sure it was a necessary phase in in earth and human development to go through this, this kind of separation. So there's a truth to it, but it's not the whole story. And to move forward or to intensify our consciousness without getting too linear and directional about it, but really intensifying, going through this intensification process to remember ourselves into the fabric of and web of life that we are participants of and are of. We're not, again, we're not separate. I think when we can overcome the story of separation and really change our thinking to have a more integral understanding of how the world works. That's the key game changer. I don't know how else, how else to state it. And it's not about going backwards. It's not about returning to some previous form of consciousness that was more embedded in nature, but maybe less consciously so. It's Again, it's this intensification of going through the mental, rational construct of separation back into or forward into a a more holistic and uh, integral understanding. And I, I think that the more we can do that, I think the world will reveal itself in ways that will allow us to embrace the changes that are coming towards us with more of a co creative and co participatory framework than just one of fear and uh oh my god have we ever screwed up and you know how do we how do we undo what we've done we're it's 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 not so much about undoing it's it's really about living with and and adapting to uh in hopefully in healthy ways this new reality that we're part of 
So I don't know. It's a, it's a tough one to talk about, honestly, because all of the language that one has to use for the next consciousness structure is the language of the current consciousness structure. So it's by it's inherently deficient in that sense. But I think you know it when you see it. And I think the idea of interdependence and our once you really like take ownership of that and and have a real deep experience of it, it's like one of those things you can't unsee. And it's not that I live in that space all the time. I'm still as much a mental man and mental rational person as the next person. But even you know, fleeting glimpses of what I believe is we're on the cusp of. And by the way, it's always there. It's like you know, it's the as Jean Gebser says, the ever present origin. It's the origin is always there. It's living within us as a latent possibility. It's up to us to to manifest it. And that is what I believe we need to do. So we'll come back to the term truth. I think we need to help with our young people and ourselves to discern what's truthful and what's not. I think this idea, (laughs) just what I saw recently around the food system and the fact that the fact that, yes, we have to think about our diet. That is one of the ways that we can participate in a healthy change. Does that mean that someone's going to come in and regulate and tell us that, you know, you only get one hamburger a month or something like that, and you have to wash it down with a plant-based beer? Oh, my God. <laughs> that is so damn funny. I just Plant-based uh, beer, right? <laughs> beer. I'm going to have to try one of those. Can we cut through the BS and stop trying to just hoodwink our neighbors into – think, you know, into buying a line of, of something that is not helpful. Like, let's just sit down and have a conversation. And moving the public discord uh, or discourse out of the realm of the absolutely absurd would be a good start, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, we because we, we are really, you know, as you said before, we have much, much more in common than we, than we have that makes us different. Not only just, you know, in general as citizens of the United States, but I mean, you know, we're all in this little marble floating through space. So we really are all on the same team, whether we want to think so or not. So just that that realization, as you mentioned, the interdependence versus this competitive thing is really a big piece. And I think it is emerging But the last couple of years have also shown us, (laughs) it's been sort of a great unveiling of a lot of the shadow side of our culture that we kind of thought we'd gotten over or that wasn't there anymore. And so a couple things, one, how do we meet those people, you know, at those different stages or levels of development, I guess, so that you can validate what's the healthy, you know, aspect of those places and then help illuminate and help them see the unhealthy aspects of those levels of development. You know, I think about Ken Wilber's work and he talks about transcendent include. So everybody's right, but partial is kind of his thing, right? So if we can honor what's a virtue and value in each of those different places, then help people to move forward. I think that's a, that's a huge piece of this. And I don't think it takes, it doesn't take a majority in the traditional sense of like, you need 50 to 70%. It's more like 10 to 20% it creates tipping points in these kind of massive cultural and sociological changes, right? And all of that has still been emerging and percolating and coming forth under the surface at the same time that all of this sort of dark shadow stuff has come up as well, right? So how are some ways that you've seen people move up those kind of levels of development? Well, I love that theory on the tipping point. And I I kind of been banking on it, you know, that we that this intensification of consciousness to bring in the new consciousness structure and shift the paradigm is, you know, hopefully predicated on maybe 10%, maybe less of people really taking full ownership of that. So that that would be that would be encouraging. And I and I actually, you know, I don't know what the actual, the number is, but I believe it's history proves it right that it's a, it is a relatively small number that can lead to an epochal shift that makes a new awareness available for everyone. So I think that's a good thing. I think when we talk about shadow, I mean, for me, again, I, I feel I really need to leave people free and we all want to be free. And I think we need, it'd probably be good to have a conversation sometime about what do we really mean by freedom? And that's a, you know, that's a whole podcast in itself, I'm sure. But the, 
the idea that when we think about the cultural shadow, well, individually, I have my shadow and I need to attend to and address and own that. And I can't hide from it. I can't skirt it. I don't need to lie about it. You know, I just need to I actually need to embrace it and love it. That's how I'm going to transform it. I have to work with my own shadow in a way where I'm, I'm willing to go there and stay with it and realize that I'm, I'm no better, no more evolved, no more further along than anybody else on this journey. I just am, you know, I'm doing the work that I'm doing and I, I'm, I have a starting point of certain privileges. I own that as well. I'm becoming super aware of my blind spots that I've operated with for decades of, you know, just sailing through life in a certain way and, and not even really being overly super aware of, of, of say, my, some of the privileges that I've just had by birthright. So I think that looking at our own shadows is a starting point and then approaching others with a, a kind of humility and respect that, well, if I got it, if I have to do this work, then they do too. And so I want to be compassionate about that. And I want to, I want to make the space that anyone, anyone can change from where they are to where they want to get to. And I, I hope people would leave me free to change and not box me in to say, oh, that's Martin. He's, you know, he's always been that way. Now, that being said, I also feel there are, <laughs> if you take the full spectrum, there are fringe elements at either end of the spectrum that I don't expect to change and transform their thinking or even necessarily be in dialogue with them because I just, I don't have the capacity and the insight how to reach people who are like, I feel just so far gone that it's just, wow. But there's a big swath of people in the middle who I feel, again, we have so much in common and, and I would like to be in dialogue with. And so I think if, if I'm earnest about that, then my starting point is to, to, to really try to deepen my own listening capacity and to really see, hear, and learn where other people are at. Not to tell them where I'm at, not to expect them to move one iota towards where I'm at, but to understand where where they're actually at. And I, if I look at my physiognomy, you know, I'm looking at, I'm feeling my head here. I have, I have two ears and one mouth. So that's how I came into the world. And I think it would be wise if I could learn to use them proportionately and try to listen at least twice as much as I speak. And I'm not doing such a good job here on the podcast, but I guess that's, uh, that's the nature of these things. I do think when we're in dialogue, you know, I, I, tell my, I told my children when they were growing up and they would get mad at something and mad at a, a teacher or whatever. And I said, well, you know, do you want them to, to hear what you have to say? And they're, yeah, oh, sure. And I said, well, then start by listening to them. And I, I guarantee you, if somebody feels like they're being listened to, it's a game changer. And the whole gesture or nature of listening is actually invited in, in a way that otherwise doesn't exist. Most people are just having two monologues and they're just going right past each other. But when you're really in a dialogue, there's something happening there where you're creating something totally new. A real genuine dialogue is a generative activity. And if we want the generative and we want the new and we want to create something that's out of us and for the future, then start with a good dialogue, start with a good human encounter, make that space to really listen to another person and let them know they're being listened to, let them really experience that. And then they'll, I think it's most often, if not universally or unanimously, you'll experience that listening then opens up and, and you'll be granted the same boon from the other party. And that to me, will be a game changer. We won't have this, this craziness of just people shouting at each other and no listening going on. That to me is a you know it's a starting point, and then we we build from there. And uh, the the idea of interest, be interested in others, have have a genuine warmth of interest in others, be interested in the world around you. That's again what I would want to cultivate in any young person is a or not even cultivate because they come into the world interested and curious and. We, we 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 tend to like educate it out of them sometimes the way that we choose to educate. So let's let's make sure we 
cultivate and maintain that sense of interest and wonder and curiosity and imagination. And that these are the tools that we're come into the world with and that what the world is crying for right now is that, the, that our human, full human capacities are really coming to their best expression in service to the world and in service to the future. That's really good. And, you know, when you have that sort of dynamic listening going on, you really are changing the, um, you're changing the, the energy, you're changing the whole dynamics of what's going on, right? And if we could just I've thought in the last year or so, you know, if we could just like take Congress and tell them there's, there is no more sides, there's no Republicans or Democrats anymore. Everybody's just here to solve the problems. Here's the problems. <laughs> Nobody gets credit because everybody gets credit. <laughs> go. go. Uh, I think that'd be a really fantastic experiment, even if they'd only do it for a week, right? Just here, here try this <laughs> and listen to each other. Some of these guys that you tend to vilify may have some good ideas once they get over trying to take credit, you know, for good things happening. I think you're, you're right on, right on track with that because you're, you're really creating change at the, at the point where it really needs to begin and also continue to flow. Right. I spoke with somebody recently who implemented holacracy, which is sort of flat organizational structure uh, kind of com- that came out of integral theory. And one of the things about that is you can't hide in an organization that's doing that because you have a responsibility to, you know, if you recognize tensions, you bring those to the fore and then you talk about, you know, what solutions could be and then they assign roles and everyone takes, you know, or whoever appropriate takes on a role to solve that problem. So if you have to learn how to articulate what the problems are and then take some responsibility for how they are addressed, then that causes you to have to learn how to communicate, learn how to articulate, learn how to deal with conflict deal with your emotional reactions to what people are saying. So it's really a personal development, sort of emotion, emotional maturity process that also has its consequences of changing the way companies run and you know, hopefully developing better products and services and all of, all of that. I also wanted to go back to something I said a moment ago, and I like the way you addressed it. So in integral theory, talking about lines of development, stage and stage and all of that, I'll, I'll let Ken Wilber defend you know, the idea of having levels, but he talks about dominator hierarchies, which is kind of what we're used to and what we think of when we're offended at someone saying there's levels to, of development uh, versus growth hierarchies and understanding you know, whole systems are holons, right? And they're nested inside of other systems. So understanding all those pieces and how they work is really what we're talking about. There are stages of development with an individual human from baby to toddler to adolescent to adult, just like there are for cultures and so they're observations more than uh, judgments. So I appreciate how you talked about that. How do you guys teach kids to communicate in this way? Well, hopefully by example, for starters, and you know, starting in early childhood where it's all where children are learning through imitation, they're, they're just seeing the world and then trying to make sense of it. And, and uh, they're, you know, through their play and everything, they're in a... Um, state of processing the world around them. So I think we need to really create good, safe spaces where they feel secure and where they feel seen, where they feel honored and respected. And and then as you go up through the grades, the journey through the grades at a water school is in some ways a mirroring of the human journey uh, writ large from a evolution or mutation of consciousness point of view. And so you're just watching the the development of the human species. And it's very much from a human perspective, what humans are capable of, uh, both the good and the bad. And there are obviously practices when you get into the older grades for restorative justice and other, other things when things go awry and one needs to address them and make amends. And we have uh, Certainly some tools in the toolkit there that come from other organizations. And there's a lot of work going on right now on issues of equity, diversity and inclusion, and racial justice and systemic racism. And we're working on multiple fronts at Hawthorne Valley on trying to understand our role and responsibility in that regard and looking at land reparations and very, very tricky and difficult subjects. And subjects that must be addressed. And 
So it's part of the disruption and it's part of the breaking down in order to really have breakthroughs. And I think that most of us would agree that this is just a, a necessary stage of our human journey to begin to acknowledge and own and then make right some of the wrongs that we've just participated in far too long. So it's difficult, it's uncomfortable, it's we're going to be prone to make lots of mistakes. And there's, you know, and there's a lot of just good tension and anxiety around us. And and you mentioned tension earlier and and in, in, in the holacracy, like tension is actually a, a good thing. And was something that we need to manage well because it's it's in that tension where the all the creativity and the juices are really flowing and if things are just static and comfortable there there won't be any change we want to embrace those moments and also manage them well and not you know hopefully not allow them to allow us to spin out of control so it's it's easier said than done it's all difficult work i think there's also some structural things when we when we talk about freedom and you know when we talk about you mentioned the challenges within our our governance system there's certainly major uh, financial inequities and we barely have an economy anymore because we have a financial system run amok that has superseded anything that would really one could really call an economy which is how do we manage our households and i tell my grade 12 class you know we have this, 7.7, 7.8 billion members in the household of human members plus the rest of the biotic community. So we have a complex management challenge here. You know, how are we going to do that? How do we organize ourselves in such a way? And then one has to look at those spheres of human activity, of economics, of politics and, and governance and rights, and of culture, and say, well, how do they stay in a good, healthy balance with each other? We're, we're working in all these realms, they intersect, and yet one should not supersede and superimpose itself over another realm in a way that creates uh, imbalance in the system. Well, we can see uh, the role of money in politics is certainly not a healthy thing. We could see the role of politics and in culture is not a healthy thing. If it becomes imbalanced, so how do we, how do we really disentangle and create a healthy balance between the cultural sphere, the economic sphere, and the sphere of rights and governance? That's something else that we're trying to understand in our own framework here, and and then certainly in the twelfth grade, they're ready to enter into dialogue around that for how how society might organize itself in such a way, and how do we recognize? When we not, are not in balance, health and balance are, for me, synonymous. So if we want to remain healthy, we need to remain balanced, our, whether, that's, whether we're talking about our own human biome and ecosystem or our own individuality, or whether we're talking about our community or whether we're talking about our country, whether we're talking about our food system, we're, we're trying to find these places and these ways of creating a balance and we know when we're out of balance, we know when we're not healthy. And so we want to come back to that place of, of keeping things in balance. I agree with everything you just said. And I've kind of been thinking about the word freedom and in a way, what you were just describing, you know, is part of that definition of freedom. Freedom is a, is a world in which all can thrive, both humans and all other beings, right. And the planet. So for all to have freedom, there needs to be systems in which all are have the opportunity for that. I think you're right. We probably could do a whole episode on freedom, but I'm kind of intrigued by that. So could you speak to um, kind of maybe a brief rambling about freedom and what you think freedom is, or at least part of what freedom is? I think freedom has to do mostly with our, our inner life and all that springs from that, which is in the cultural sphere. So whether it's how we choose to uh, relate to the deeper mysteries, whether we call that worship or religion or whatever, you know, however we want to call it. We, I think we need to be really free to, to come into those relationships in a way where we're not, that's not being forced upon us or dictated to us in any way. That would be an imbalance to me. Out of the cultural sphere, then, you know, that includes education, that includes art and research. And these are things where I think we need to be able to enter into them with a 
certain degree of autonomy and freedom. And in order to do that, we need bodies of agreements amongst ourselves to make sure that we know where our freedom you know, ends and another person begins, so to speak, so that we're not encroaching or infringing on someone else. And that then becomes the rights sphere. And in that rights sphere, where we could say, whereas culture would be, freedom would be the North Star, then in the rights sphere, it would be equality, that we, there are certain, I mean, we all have certain inalienable equal rights that we should be afforded, and nobody should be excluded from that. And so in the rights sphere, we can come up with the agreements to ensure that those, those rights are upheld. And then the economic sphere is the one that always is the most interesting to me because in economics, there are, we are entering into agreements and arrangements where we are not necessarily always equal. So if you trade a dollar for, for a dollar, then that's of equal value. And that seems like, okay, it's, we're, we're talking about equality here. But if, if we're talking about actually agreements of reciprocity, you might say, hey, you know, I need help with my homework. And I might say, well, I need a ride to Great Barrington. And you say, well, if you help me with my homework, I'll give you a ride to Great Barrington. We can agree that that is a reciprocal arrangement of, of compassionate reciprocity or mutuality. And, and we could then you know, enter into that agreement and uphold each end of the bargain. Well, it's, there's not any way to really say that was equal. That's not the point. So again, if we, if we look at these different realms, we could say there are different guide stars of mutuality or reciprocity in the economic sphere of, of equality in, in the sphere of our rights and of uh, freedom in our sphere of, of culture. And so I think freedom is something that it's, it's not, I can do whatever the hell I please. That's, I do not think that's what freedom means. And I, I'm sad that I think that it sometimes gets perverted into that misapplication. I think that even if we look at the you know, founding fathers of this country and coming out of an age and as imperfect as it was, I really do think that what they were speaking to when they were setting up this experiment was really a place where there's this inner freedom for people to become who they are meant to be in the world. And then you do that through the body of agreements and through mutuality and reciprocity in the economic sphere. And you just try to create a balance between the three. And, and it makes sense to me. Like I can see that that could work. And we, you know, again, we tried to practice that a little bit in our own internal uh, ecosystem here at Hawthorne Valley, just to play it out somewhat and allow things to run that way. We haven't perfected it by any means, but it's, it's fun to tinker. Thank you for your thoughts and your time. I, we're out of time now, and I want to be respectful of your uh, schedule. I appreciate the insights. And I, I think we may have to do something uh, with that freedom topic in a little bit more detail. Are there any thoughts you'd like to leave with us in, uh, in parting or uh, resources you might want to pour, point people to, to uh, move forward in these areas that we've been discussing? No, I would just say thank you very much uh, for enduring listening and uh, for today, inviting me to, to, to kind of rant here. And uh, it's really a pleasure, David, to be with be with you again in dialogue and uh and i look forward to one day when you you know can come out and visit and next time i'm out on the west coast to see my son and grandson out there i'll, I'll uh they're, they're not too far from you and in, in the uh olympia seattle area there so and i have good friends in um, in oregon portland and and a little bit east of portland so i'll, I'll try to make it out your way when i'm out there that but for sure, uh, it's it's nice to know that you're doing this. It's nice to know that uh, people are are interested and uh, yes, stay that way and and look after each other. And that was Martin Ping. Find him and Hawthorne Valley Association at hawthornevalley.org. To celebrate the 50th anniversary of Hawthorne Valley Association, they recently released a new podcast, Roots to Renewal which began with an interview with Francis Moore LePay, author of Diet for a Small Planet, and followed it up with their second episode, which featured Bill McKibben. As I understand, they have many more on the way. Find that show wherever you listen to your podcasts or via the link in the show notes. Though I'd like to hear more about Martin's ideas of freedom, that's a discussion for another day, as what stands out for me as we draw this to a close is the idea of engaging with listening more than we speak 
and finding shared connections. Over the many years of hosting the Permaculture Podcast, I have encountered practitioners from all walks of life, with a range of personal and political perspectives that vary widely and are often in opposition to my own background and worldview. What I've found time and time again is that what separates us from one another is often only a small part of our lives. If we can recognize one another's humanity and what we have in common, what we don't agree on is rarely a reason to divide ourselves from one another. In all but one case out of thousands, I've been able to find common ground, often around growing food for ourselves and future generations, or on the intricacies of what it means to design for human use. As Martin said, let us listen twice as often as we speak, so we might all be heard. If you have a question you'd like answered on air, start the conversation by getting in touch. Send a text message to 717-827-6266, an email to show at thepermaculturepodcast.com, or write Scott Mann, 210 East Fairfax Street, number 300, Falls Church, Virginia, 22046. If you enjoyed this interview and would like early access to this and others like it, as well as weekly updates, monthly AMAs, listener polls, and much more, become a Patreon supporter today at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast. Until the next time, spend each day creating resilience while taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other.